Lamb, uh, a couple announcements we need to make this morning. Uh, Crystal, she's got an announcement concerning kids camp, I believe it is, isn't it, Crystal? Go ahead if you would. Amen. Praise God. So let's get behind the, the children. How many do we have going to camp this year, Crystal? 23 kids going to camp this year. Man, that's, that's worth a hand clap in itself. Amen. Bless the Lord forevermore. Now, what's the cost for, for each kid? So uh, you can see why we're trying to uh, raise funds for the, for the kids because if you've got three kids in your family, that's pretty expensive. Even though church camp is, it's one of the cheapest church, church camps around. But uh, bless the Lord, that's one of the ways that we're trying to raise income so that every child would be able to go to church camp. And believe me, when they come back, are they ever blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb. So listen, you'll be blessed above and beyond. Hallelujah, as you sow seed into some of these children in Jesus' name. Bless the Lord. And let me say this, hallelujah, even if they don't raise the funds, the church is going to pick up. If your kid can't, if you don't have the money, we will make sure that they get to camp in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless the Lord. Uh, Tracy? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we need to get behind that as well in the name of the Lord. I don't know about you, but we're family in this church. Amen. Bless the Lord. And we stand behind each family. When one family hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all rejoice because we're a family of the living God. And everybody said amen and amen. Let me say this also. No PM service this evening because of Father's Day. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. And let me say this, I thank the Lord for, for uh, uh, the opportunity uh, of uh, having Jeff to fill in for me while I went on vacation. Sometimes it's, you know, when, as being a preacher, when you go on vacation, you look for people to fill in, and sometimes you've got to get people outside of the church. And so we thank God for uh, the faithfulness of Jeff. And Lori, to stand in the gap to make up the hedge in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust you had a good time in the presence of the Lord while we had a good time in uh, 106 degree heat index while you guys was flooding back here. But uh, I, I made a post on Facebook. Uh, I took a picture of the top of my head. I didn't get that on the beach. I got that when we got into... South Carolina, and we stopped at a, a gas station to take a little break, and I thought, I'm going to put my top down on the convertible. We haven't turned, put the top down, you know, since we've been on vacation, or I haven't rode in it much, you know, and even put the top down. So I put the top down, and I drove two hours till we got into Myrtle Beach, and after we got into Myrtle Beach, my head looked like a lobster that's been cooked. 
I mean from here on down my nose. And, and then, you know, it started peeling off. And I thought, man, I mean, this is ugly. I mean, horrible. And uh, I was trying to get that, this, the, the, the dead skin off my top of my head. Still got a little bit on top of my head. But nothing like it was. And I thought, man, I'm going to stand before my people. And, and uh, they're going to think, man, I've got some type of disease or what have you. But we had a great time at Myrtle Beach. Yes, the, it was hot, but you get down on the beach and just sit back and relax and just enjoy the breeze that comes off of the, the ocean. And, of course, there were shark attacks up and down the Atlantic coast. I know that there was one in uh, Florida. There was uh, two people in North Carolina. And I'm telling you what, you went down on the beach, and that, I'm telling you, there, you looked out in the water, and there wasn't hardly one soul in the water. And I thought, I didn't drive 700 miles to stand on the beach. I, I come to go into the water, hallelujah, and ride some of the waves, body surf. So we did that. We went out there, and bless God, I still got both limbs. I still got my legs and still had fun swimming in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, we left a little bit early, come back Friday uh, night, what it was, and, and uh, of course it's about an 8, 12 hour trip, I think it is, and got in late uh, uh, Friday night or Saturday morning early, and uh, the kids come left Saturday morning, and uh, as I take it, uh, Seth had car problems in Charleston, wasn't it, or someplace, and he had to leave his van there, so he's going back, is that today, or? He's gone back today with a trailer to pick up his van to come back. So we need to have traveling mercies. I can't even think of that. After traveling all that way and then traveling right back, you know, it, it, I thought, man, Lord, where are you at in this? But anyhow, we'll just give the Lord glory, praise, and honor, and thanksgivings. Bless the Lord that God worked something good out of something bad in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So let's pray, if we would, please, for traveling mercies. Father, we thank you, and we praise you, God, just to be with Seth. Lord, I thank you for touching and ministering. Give him strength, God, for we know that he's tired of driving. And Lord, I just thank you that somehow and some way, Lord, that something good would come out of this. What it might be, I don't know, but you do know. So, Father, we just place it into your hands in the wonderful name of Jesus, as we truly give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, you know, there's nothing worse than having car troubles when you're on vacation. Amen. Nothing worse, especially if you have a breakdown or what have you. I thank God for the many times that we have traveled over the years with my children. There have been times we, we took off from Delphos, Ohio, and drove all the way out to California and back. In, in vans, and I think about the worst thing that ever happened was I blowed a tire out and had to go in and get a get a tire repaired or what have you. But, uh, you know, you stop and think, man, some of these th places that I was in were so remote, I, they had to pump sunlight back into some of these these areas. But we thank God over the years, you know, safety of, in our travels, and we made many trips out to California. That's where my wife's uh, uh, mom and dad lived, and sisters as well. Bless the Lord, but God's seen us through all of those in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Not alone ministering out west and through the Indian missions up through Utah and Montana and all through those areas and, and up into Yellowstone and, 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 and uh, Grand Canyon down through those areas. Hallelujah. Man, there's so many times that, that, that the enemy could have tried to snuff us out, but we thank God for the prayers of God's people and for the safety that God gives to us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Other than that, we had a good time. Bless the Lord. Sitting back, resting, relaxing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise the Lord. What makes a happy father? I said, what makes a happy father? Some would say a happy wife. <laughs> well, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> that could be a good, good, good possibility, amen? Because there's nothing worse than a, a, a discouraged wife, hallelujah. But I believe this, what makes a happy father is really not in the materialistic realm, but it's in the spiritual realm. I don't know about you, but I want to brag on my heavenly Father this morning. And I don't know about you as well, bless the Lord, but 
I believe every blood-bought child of the living God, hallelujah, has got something good to say about their heavenly Father. Somebody say amen. amen. Bless the Lord. I, I pulled some statistics off the internet just before I come up here, facts and figures, and it says, in the United States alone, 21.2 million children, 26 of all children are growing up in a household with only one custodial parent. Among black children, 48.5% are growing up with a single custodial parent. Five, uh, five out of every six custodial parents are mothers, 84%. One in six are fathers, that's 16%. Poverty, children in father-absent father homes are five times more likely to be poor. In, 2000 and, uh, in, in 2002, 7.8 of children in mar married couples' families were living in poverty compared to 38.4 of children in female household families. Drug and alcohol abuse. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services states fatherless children are at a dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse, sexual activity, and teen pregnancy. Adolescent females between the age of 15 and 19 years reared in homes without fathers are significantly more likely to engage in premarital sex than adolescent females required in homes with both a mother and a father. Children in single-parent families are more likely to get uh, uh, pregnant as teens and their peers who grow up with two parents. Educational achievements. In studies involving only 25,000 children using nationally representative data sets, children who lived with only one parent had lower grade point average, lower college aspirations, poor attendance records, and higher drop-out rates than students who lived with both parents. Fatherless children are twice as likely to drop out of school. Crime. Children in single parent families are more likely to be in trouble with the law than their peers who grow up with two parents. I don't know about you, but it's vitally important that the family unit, hallelujah, have a father figure in that family unit. I, I understand something. Bless the Lord. God put the marriage together. Can you say that with me? God put the marriage together. One more time. God put the marriage together. And look at me. That marriage was not Adam and Steve, but that marriage was Adam and Eve. I don't, uh, you know, if the Lord should tarry in what is being taught in our school systems to our children, transgenderism, hear me, homosexuality, an alternative lifestyle, can I tell you what in the world is this nation going to look like in 10 years from now? Stop and think of this a second. Hallelujah. It's God that has put man and woman together. Can somebody say that? God has put man and woman together. Now one day it's going to be illegal for Pastor Martin to say that or make that very statement. Hear me without being chastised by our government. Mark my words, there's a day coming, hear me, that that would be called hate speech, and it's just around the corner. It's not, listen, something that's far-fetched and something that's, you know, way far off, but I believe it's one of the next things and one of the next areas where the government will come in and any person that really stands by Judeo principles, hear me, child of God, and goes against what the world society says and believes, look at me, it, there would be a hate crime. Listen, I don't know about you, but I've determined in my heart and in my life and in my spirit, I stand my ground. Hallelujah. I'll not be removed from the principles that God has placed in my spirit and in my heart in Jesus' name. Praise God. I'll not give in and I'll not give up even though the world system says everybody's doing it. Look at me. Not everybody is doing it. Thank God for godly fathers and godly mothers, hallelujah, that will raise their children 
in the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Hallelujah. If the church should tarry, hear me, child of God, listen, praise God, what you're instilling into your children, they'll carry the torch of the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ into their generation. I pray for my grandchildren even to this day. God, if you should tarry, put godly men and women in their path that they might marry in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let what has been instilled in them as children, hallelujah, that they instill it into their children's children if you should tarry in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I want to be one of those parents that have instilled Judeo principles into my family. And as I see my family raising their children, my grandchildren in the ways of the Lord, can I tell you something? It swells my head up and I say, God, your word is truth. Your word is everlasting. If you'll raise your children in the ways of the Lord, look at me, child of God. God will bless your seed and your seed will be mighty upon the face of the earth. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Now let me give you another statistic. Nine out of ten preachers' kids don't even attend church today. Why? Understand me. Why is it that that, that, that great of a statistic would take place even though they lived under a godly influence? Hallelujah. I can say this in my own experience that understand sometimes what happens in preachers' lives, they put the congregation before their own family. And what good would it do, hear me, if we win the whole soul or win the whole world and lose our only children? Hallelujah. Let me say this. Hallelujah. God is number one. Can you say that with me? God is number one. Hallelujah. The family is number two. And can I tell you, number three is the church. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything should be centered around God, family, and church. Do I got an amen in here this morning? Let me ask the question, how many in here have been raised by godly parents? Let me see your hands. Few of them. Bless the Lord. Now let me ask this next question. Hallelujah. Only you can answer it. Bless the Lord if your parent is here today or if, it is, if they're not here today, if they've gone on and be with the Lord or maybe they're just not even saved. They might not go to church. What is the trait that, ha that they have left in you that you see yourself doing the very same thing that they've done? Do I got any takers in here? What's the trait that has been left unto you? Jess? Pray for your kids. Amen. Bless the Lord. Come on, somebody else. Use your manners. What is it? Using your manners. Amen. I fall short in that. <laughs> I had a preacher say, you mean tell me you're not opening up the door for your wife? Shame on you. And you know, sometimes you just kind of hillbilly like it. You know what I mean? You just kind of forget about it. And just walk off, or you walk in front of them, or in the, uh, or don't open the door. You just walk in, let the door go by. You know, I, I, I'm bad at that, and I'm still bad at that. And I say, God help me. I say, God help me. Come on, somebody say amen. God help me. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. But some would say, oh, you know, they got to be a sissy if they do stuff like that. No, you know what? That, that, that shows honor to the opposite sex. Listen, bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Sometimes when I come into church, you know, I want to buzz right in and then I'll stop and I'll remember I need to open that door up for my wife. So I'll do that. But can I tell you, I wish I could stand here and tell you I do that all the time. But I don't do that all the time. And listen, how many mothers in here appreciate that? Amen. It shows respect to them. Somebody say amen. amen. Shows respect to them. Bless the Lord. What's some of the trait? That maybe your daddy put in you, in you as being a child. Meg? Got in church first before any other sporting event, anything. It's not easy, but doing it. 
Amen. Praise God. I got lamb blasted and lampooned for doing that, but you know what? Bless God. My children are all serving Jesus, and thank the Lord for it. Linda? Amen. Bless God. Praise the Lord. Somebody else. Phil. Feed your what is it? Work and feed your yes, amen. That's right in my message that I'm going to talk about. Respect your elders. Good one. So powerful because you're seeing kids today that do not respect elders. I don't care if they're your own kids or whoever they might be. You see so disrespectful children, hear, hear me, that they, the, they don't respect the older generation. Hallelujah. And you know what? I give credit to those ones, those, those sons or daughters that will show respect to those that are of the older generation, so to speak, in the name of Jesus. And don't forget, one day you're going to be one of those older generations. Amen. Bless the Lord. Somebody else had their hand up. Praise. Amen. Bless the Lord. How many know traits can rub off on you? Different things. Some would say this. You know, when I grow up, I'm not going to be like my dad. And then after you've grown up, you find yourself, after you do things, you go, man, that's just like my dad would do. And you find out that, hey, he's done instilled something in me that can't be taken away from me. Bless the Lord. You know, some of our loved ones, some of dads are, are, are passed on in the presence of the Lord. And you know what? The thing of it is, their seed still remains on the inside of us. And still carries on some of the traits of our moms or even of our dads in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Tony, you had your hand up. Amen. Praise God. Give Fred a hand clap. Would you do that? Bless the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Grandparents can do the very same thing. They see them serving the Lord and bless God being eager and working eagerly. Praise the Lord. It all, listen, it all goes into the hearts of some of these little ones in the name of the Lord Jesus. And can I say this? Hear me. Don't be afraid to give honor and praise to them this side of the grave and not wait till the grave comes and say, Oh, I wish I had the time to sit, sit down and tell mom or tell dad, you know, how much I love them and how much I appreciated everything that they had done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody else in here this morning. Jamie. Isn't that awesome? Bless God. Powerful. Amber? Um, to spend time with your kids. Not just be a dad, but spend time. You always play with us. We have so many memories of you spending time with us. It's very important. Amen. Amen. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. And you know, you see some of those traits not only in your kids, but you see them in your grandkids coming up. I, I noticed the, the other day, Aubrey, I mean, she just loves to fish. Amber liked to fish. She'd just sit and fish and fish and fish. And Aubrey's got that same trait going into her. She always wants to help, constantly wants to help. If, I'm, if I was changing a tire, Amber wanted to know how I'd change that tire and wanted to help. Aubrey, I see that very same thing. She wants to help. How do you, what's this, Grandpa? How do you do this? And all those things, you know, the, and you look at that and you think, man... You know, you didn't think they was catching in on anything, but can I tell you something? Some things are instilled in them that they will never, ever forget in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when I'm dead and gone, hear me, child of God, if the Lord should tarry, they'll say, you know what? Dad did that very same thing. Our mom did that very same thing. Praise the Lord. It brings up good memories of mother and of father in the name of the Lord. Mothers, you know, we've already given you glory, but we want to talk about the dads today, okay? <laughs> Bless the Lord. Somebody else this morning. Bless God. Judy? My grandparents passed away with old hand <laughs> But the biggest thing they taught me that I've learned through my life and taught my kids, 
but do unto others as you want others to yep. do unto you. And if that is such a blessing right there, because if you're kind to of them, they're kind to of you. If you're kind yes. to people, and, and that, that's one that I never forgot. How true. Bless Amen. the Lord. How true that is. Anybody else this morning? Praise God. Hallelujah. I remember back years ago, my dad was really the spiritual one in my family. And I got to leave my mother on the deathbed. And thank God that she did give her heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was my dad that took me to a little Baptist church years and years ago. Back when I was probably in the age of around 10, 11 years old where I first heard a salvation message. And my dad was very faithful in going to that little country church, that Baptist church. And I still remember sitting in the classroom, Sunday school rooms, that, and we'd sing some of those old songs. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. And you know what? Even when I went into my high school years, I would find myself going down the halls of, of school You know, and those songs would pop up in my mind. I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. I wasn't serving God, but you know what? That was still popped up. It was something that was instilled in me. Every Sunday morning, we would go to church. Bless the Lord. That was a, that was, you know, it it, it wasn't just a special occasion like an Easter service, whatever. We would go to church and God instilled that into me back years and years ago, the, the faithfulness that my dad would have in getting us up and taking us to church every Sunday morning. Bless the Lord. I still can remember at the age of 11, 12 years old, going to the old folks' homes. Listen, they taught me a lot of good things, a lot of good traits in the Baptist church. Knocking on doors and telling, and visiting old people and Tell them about the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those things still popped into my heart, into my mind at an early age. Some things, they'll never leave you no matter how old you are. I'm 66 years old. Look at me. Hallelujah. And I can look back and it seems like yesterday I sat in that old Baptist church with wooden pews. Hear me. Of course, we wasn't too verbal. Didn't hear too many amens. Are you hearing me? Not too many smiles. But listen, hallelujah, some of the things that was instilled in my heart as being a child was never taken from me even up to this age in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for all of that in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, for if it wouldn't have been for my dad taking me to a little Baptist church, I'd really not know about the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. But little did my dad know that somewhere down along the line, I would become a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and preach the gospel all over the world. Little did I know that I would be able to preach the gospel all over the world. Some would say, come on, Pastor Martin, all over the world. I mean that. I've been all over. Hallelujah. From New Zealand, down under, way further than than, uh, Australia, to uh, Central America, to England, to uh, Guatemala, to El Salvador, uh, Texas, I, I've been all over preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stop and think of this. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And only God could take, listen, a young boy born out by Scotch Crossing, Ohio. I don't know about if you know where Scotch Crossing, Ohio is. Matter of fact, it's not a, t- it's not, it's not a town. It's just called Scotch Crossing. But I, did, I, I was born and reared right there in that area, hear me, that God would take a little poor person, hear me, and make a preacher out of him. Can I tell you this? We serve an amazing God. And I say this, hear me, child of God, I say this, you don't know what your son or what your daughter is going to be in the future if God should tarry. There might be potential preachers setting in here. You don't know. There might be potential missionaries setting in here. You don't know. Hear me. Hallelujah. But you can know that God's got a calling on individuals' lives as being moms and dads. You can see it, you can sense it, and you can feel it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we thank God for all the fathers 
Hallelujah, in here this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let me ask this question. I must ask another question. Hallelujah. How many in here, young men and young women, thought that they could talk back to their daddy and get away with it? There ain't no too many hands going up. How many thought that, you know, after you get a certain age, uh, moms or dads, you know, they're kind of ignorant. We're way smarter than what they are. Am I talking to anybody in here? You know, I remember my mother, if I spoke harsh to her, she would put a bar of soap in my mouth. Anybody ever had a bar of soap deal on you, in you? I hated that. I mean, she'd grab a hold of me and grab a bar of soap and, and slip that in my mouth if I sassed back at her or what have you. And, and understand me, I was an ordinary kid. I used to like to pick on my mom, hear me, and tease her. She didn't like that at all. And can I tell you, listen, she'd show me by putting a bar of soap in my mouth, and I'd say, oh, Mom, no, don't do that. Give me a whipping. I'd rather have a whipping than have a bar of soap in my mouth. Hallelujah. Not alone. Don't tell Dad. You know, you give me a whipping. You put the soap in my mouth, but don't tell Dad what I did. Why? Because I knew What was coming? Can I tell you this? Hallelujah. My dad would take a switch off of a, off of a apple tree, and that thing would be nice and slick and smooth. And if I'd done something wrong, I mean that switch come across my hind end, and it just felt like it cut right straight through me. How many know he had my attention? I can still remember the days, hear me, that those Spankings came to me, and can I tell you this? It didn't hurt me one iota. Understand something. You know why God patted your behind? It's the only place that's padded. Or it should be. Sometimes when we get old, it gets padded up here. It's the only place that's padded. And the reason why it's padded so that you can get pat holes. <laughs> I remember my kids, Mandy, especially when they, they would get out of line and, they, and if they would be bad in church, I'd tell them that they're getting spankings when they got home. They knew because we never had no junior church. We never had no, no place for them to go. We didn't have no nursery or anything else. They sat in church and had to be good. I mean, there wasn't no talking back and forth. And how many know you can preach and watch your kids at the same time? And when they would do something wrong, look at me, they knew by just looking at my eyes, we'd have eye contact, that after church something was going to happen. Hello. And I remember one time Mandy put books in her hind end. She knew what was going to happen. Put book. How many know that that didn't work? I said that just didn't work. But I'll tell you what, hear me, some of those things that happened back years and years and years ago, I can still remember them just like they was yesterday. Even though, listen, some of my my, my parents are both in heaven, I can still have my memory memories and it's just as if they're here with me today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Something that can never be taken away from you is your memories that you have, hallelujah, of your parents. Bless the Lord. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the name of the Lord Jesus? I remember, it's been back several years ago, my wife put a plaque on my desk saying, it's not easy being a perfect dad, but somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do it. Can I tell you something? I don't claim perfection, and I'm far from perfection, but I do know one thing, hallelujah, God will shore up my imperfections if we'll allow Him to shore up our imperfections. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. If I so desire Him to move in my heart and in my life. Some of you just start out in marriage, hear me, and you don't have children, but you will have children in the very near future if the Lord should tarry. Bless God. And you're wondering how in the world are, are we going to raise our children? How are we going to rear them up? And let me tell you, there's no perfect dads here. Understand me, there's no perfect mothers here. 
but we've got a perfectly heavenly Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah, that can put some traits in you and you can raise your children in the ways of our heavenly Father. Bless God and have joy unspeakable in your home life in Jesus' name. Nothing like having a godly family. Amen? Bless the Lord. But I fall far short of being the perfect dad. But I believe, as I said, God will strengthen up those very areas that we lack in. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Jesus said this, he, or Paul did through the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Hallelujah. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Bless the Lord forevermore. Hallelujah. Can I tell you this? Hear me. Your strength is made perfect in your weakness. Why? Because when you're weak, that's when you're strong and your dependency is not upon what you can do, but what God can do in and through us. I don't rightly know how to rear a family if it wouldn't be for being in the family of God. I wouldn't know how rightly to rear up my children in the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ, lest God the Father be my heavenly Father. Hallelujah. So we need to start off on the right track, and that's number one, to let God be your heavenly Father. How can God be your heavenly Father? Number one, you've got to admit, I'm a sinner, I need the grace, and I need the mercy of God. I need a new life. I need a new start. How many's ever done that before? Let me see your hands. I need a new start. And when you repent before God, God instantly comes into your heart and into your life and calls you a son or a daughter of the living God. Look at me. You're on the right track. You're on the right track in rearing your children in the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. What is the father's responsibility in the household? I'm glad you asked the question. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy 5, 8. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. How many know that's a pretty strong statement? Not only provide family needs, hear me, physical needs, but most of all spiritual needs to the family. Now understand me, God's the one that put the family together. Stop and think of this. My responsibility, hear me, is to clothe my family, make sure my family's got a roof over their head, that I provide for them, hear me, the physical needs that they need, Hallelujah. And most of all, that I provide spiritual needs into their hearts and into their lives. That's the greatest responsibility of a father is to provide spiritual needs for your children in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Always remember, child of God, little eyes are watching every move that you make. I've said it before, but I'm, it bears repeating. If you're a crabby mom or a crabby dad, maybe you've been a crab at the workplace, and understand me, this can happen. I've been there, had a bite out of that apple, and when you come home, look at me, your home instantly turns into a war zone. Come on, somebody put a smile on your face and say, ouch, that hurts. I know what you're talking about. Your home instantly becomes a war zone. Why? Because you've been infested by bitter people. And bitterness has got a way of rubbing itself off on you. Something didn't go right at the shop. Something didn't go right. And the guys that you're sitting around, they're mumbling and grumbling and complaining. And all of a sudden you find yourself as a Christian Listen, siding in with them, mumbling and grumbling, and then when it was 3.30, when it's time for you to punch the clock, you punched the clock, but yet you didn't walk out of your job. Your job went with you back home, and you know what? You let your family have everything that you went through at work. And you dumped that heavy load on them. How many know that's not right? I said, that's not right. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Bless the Lord. Understand something. Being a dad is a, is a great responsibility, hear me, of his family. 
God's the one that put the family unit together. Nod your head. Now I'm no male chauvinist, hear me, but the Lord said God, or man, is to be head over the woman. That's scripture. It doesn't mean that man dictates to a woman. It means that man loves the woman. And if man loves the woman, he's going to have no problem with her submitting to his lordship. Amen. Come on. Amen. Thank you, Judy, for that one amen. <laughs> I'm serious. Amen. Praise the Lord forevermore. Hallelujah. You know, I've seen and I've, I've counseled with many people. And I've heard, heard uh, uh, husbands say this. Well, you know, she's responsible to me and she's got to do what I tell her to do. Whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. God didn't put you as a dictator. God put you there. Hear me, child of God. Hallelujah. Number one, as a lover of Him to shed the love and grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ into the family unit. And can I tell you something? Hear me. If we're not in line with the Word of God, the family, hear me, the family hurts. If we do it God's way, hear me, God will bless it in Jesus' name. Glory to God. I don't know any other way to raise my children until the family's here at Harvest Field. The only way you can rear your children is raise them in the ways of of the Lord Jesus Christ, and your seed will be mighty on the face of the earth. <laughs> Glory to God. The Bible says, in all your ways acknowledge Him. Acknowledge who? The Lord. Hallelujah. I say this, God, I've got an awesome responsibility. I've got four daughters I've got to raise. And how many know if you've got four daughters, you're going to have a lot of boys coming around when they get to be teenagers. Of course, nowadays, they don't have to be teenagers. I've heard kids saying, well, he's dating such and such, and they're seven years old. I said, what? <laughs> oh, they, they're not dating like you think. Well, it shouldn't even be in their minds at seven years old. Amen. Come on. Right. Come on. You know, well, you know he, he likes this one, and, and there's nothing wrong with puppy love. Hear me. But you know what? That ought to be the furthest thing as far away from kids. You know, they want to play with Dow babies. They want to play with mice. They want to do this. They want to do that. Cars and what have you as boys. Frogs. Stop and think of it. And they're worried about some boy or some girl. Hear me. Hallelujah. And the, God, and the man has got to straighten all of that out. He's the priest. Of the household. When, when Adam and Eve fell from grace, away from the Lord, where did God go first? Where did He go first? Who did He acknowledge first? Did He go to Eve? He didn't even mention Eve. He went right directly to the priest of the house, which is Adam. And can I tell you something? It was God that put the family unit together, and he made the man the head of the family. And when the woman fell, hear me, child of God, God went right directly to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? Can I tell you something? Every man that calls themselves Christian will one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of how they raised their children. Now look at me a second. Those children that you are feeding, those children that you're putting clothes on their back, they don't belong to you, they belong to God. God's the one that's seen fit to give you children to be their caretakers here on the face of the earth, to lead them to Jesus Christ at an early age and point them to faithfulness unto God Almighty. And one day when we stand, hear me, at the judgment seat of the Lord to receive rewards, 
God will say, what did you do with the children I gave you? Well, I did this, I did that, I did this, all different types of worldly things. But what did you do spiritually for those children? Well, I helped a little old lady across the street. No. Dad, we've got an awesome responsibility as being a priest of the house. It's time for dads to step up to the plate and be the father figure in the household instead of the mom in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. When something goes wrong in the household and you've got the little kids around you, dad, step up to the plate and say, bless God, let's grab hands and let's pray and bind the powers of hell that's trying to steal away the joy of this family in Jesus' name. And doing so, you're teaching your kids how to pray. Because when they grow up, they said, hey, dad and mom did this, so this is what we're going to do to our children. Come on, kids, let's get our hands together, set ourselves in agreement in prayer, and bind the powers and principalities of hell in Jesus' name. Amen. But you see, if that's not done in the household, you can't expect your children to be raised in the ways of the Lord. You know, I thank God for my dad and for, for the, the background that he gave me in church services. But my dad, his God, was fishing and hunting. And God was, you know, maybe on the third rung. And he taught me how to hunt, how to coon hunt. Anybody ever been coon hunting before? From a little kid on up, I remember probably about the age of maybe six, seven years old carrying a coil lamp. And dad keep me out in the woods till maybe midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And listen to those old dogs just hollering and carrying on. And I could tell you everything the dogs was doing just by the way they was barking. I knew when they had a coon up the tree. I knew when they was on a cold track. And I knew when they was on a deer track. Are you hearing me? I knew all of that. It was instilled in me as a kid. It was one of the traits that my dad left me. As fishing, he learned, taught me patience to wait because sooner or later the fish are going to bite. He not only taught me how to catch fish, but how to skin fish. And I can lay the fish out, fillet them, take the bones out of them. Knew all of that stuff. I mean, it was right down to the T. He taught those things as almost religious articles in my life. And can I tell you something? When I start growing up, hear me, that's what I start doing. I started hunting. I started fishing. Is there anything wrong with hunting? Is there anything wrong with fishing? No. I still hunt. I still fish, but nothing like I used to. But all those traits that my dad put in me, hear me, they come out of me when I get older. Bless the Lord. And I say this, you know, those things literally started becoming a God to me even after I got saved. I've said to this congregation many times, I would spend more time in the woods with my dogs than what I would with my wife. Now that's a bad statement. Because it looks like I love my dogs more than I love my wife. And I really intentionally didn't, you know, have that in my heart that I didn't love my wife, but I'd give no time to her. I spent more time in the woods. And I remember very plainly the day that the Lord spoke to my heart out in the woods. I don't know, it was probably about 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock, and he said this. He said, either those dogs go or you're going to be left out in cold. One of the two. You know what I said? 
Yes, Lord. I went home and immediately sold those dogs, and I have not had a coon dog since then. Are you hearing me? I got rid of it. Why? Because it is destroying my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear me. Destroy my relationship at home. Some things that are innocent, the devil can use to destroy the family unit. Why does he want to destroy the family unit, the Christian unit? Why does he want to do that? Because strong families make strong churches. But hear me, child of God, hallelujah. Dysfunctional families make dysfunctional, hear me, churches. So we believe that God is making, hear me, a functional family here at Harvest Field because we put God first in our hearts and in our life in the name of Jesus. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Some things the Lord spoke to my heart that they hurt because I loved them. I loved to do what I wanted to do. But can I tell you something? Hear me. Hallelujah. It was the best choice that God gave to me to make me who I am today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise the Lord. But what builds a good family? Hallelujah. What builds a good family? Listening to Phil Donahue. Listening to Dr. Phil. He's going to tell me, you know, if I've got a dysfunctional family, if I've got a family that's on top. Oh, better yet, Oprah tell you, what makes a good family? Those might be the evangelists of the world. But can I tell you something? They ought not to be the evangelists, hear me, and the guides for the Christian in the name of the Lord. For foolish is the man that puts his trust in man. But blessed is the man that puts his trust in God Almighty in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit be your leader, your conscience, and your guide, and you'll surely hit the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus our Lord. Does that make sense? Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. We've got an awesome responsibility. Look at Genesis, if you would please. Genesis, the second chapter. Genesis 2 Look at the seventh verse. That's not on back there, Chris. Don't work. Genesis 2, 7. And read with me. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now jump over to the 18th verse and read with me. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Underline that in your Bible, a helpmeet. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. Now look at the 21st verse. Read with me. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. You know, sometimes when your wife is speaking to you, you fall in that deep sleep. And he... <laughs> ah, glory. My wife's always telling me, you're not hearing me. I said, you're not speaking up. <laughs> I mean, no, you can hear, but you don't want to hear. Come on, come on, folk. Hallelujah. You let them go on, and then you say, yeah, that's right. Yep, yep, yep. And you don't know a word they said to you, because you was thinking about something else. Hallelujah. <laughs> let me laugh a little bit. Can I do that? Praise God. And a deep sleep fell upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. 
And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. Hallelujah. I'm convinced if God put the first marriage together and performed the first marriage, the creator of marriage itself, it is very necessary that God be number one in the marriage, otherwise the marriage will not work. I said it will not work. Hear me. Hallelujah. Well, I know people that have been married for years, you know, and they don't even serve God. Well, they might be married, but they're miserably married. I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people that are miserably being married. Are you hearing me? Understand something. I don't want to be miserably married. I want to be in love with my wife that our house is a, a castle of love and not a war zone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God made me made, uh, made us male and female, and these two shall be one flesh. Hallelujah to the Lamb. One flesh. Look at me, husband. Understand me. What you lack is what your wife will make up. Can I say that again? What you lack is what your wife can make up. Stop and think of this a second. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I thank God for some of the things that my wife does because, you know, it wouldn't dawn on me, especially around Christmas time. When it comes time to buy all the presents for for uh, 13 grandkids, look at me. I'd pull out my hair. <laughs> but she knows exactly what to do. I wouldn't know what to do. Sometimes I have a hard time figuring out, look at me, the birthdays. Sometimes I even forget my wife's birthday and it dawns on me, uh-oh, I, far, you know, I, I forgot my wife's birthday. Because you're thinking of your grandkids' birthdays and birthdays of the church people, families, and what have you. And then you forget your own wife. You see, she's bone in my bone and flesh of my flesh. She's a part of me. Hallelujah. When I'm apart with her, look at me. She's still part of me. And she's still part of you. Bless the Lord forevermore. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And you know, one of my responsibilities as being the husband of the household and her being... Uh, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, I've got to take the role as being the priest and lead her in paths of righteousness. I'll guarantee you every woman in here is looking for leadership spiritually in their husbands. Some husbands are not saved. The wife has got to take the role of the leadership lest your children go astray. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> Glory to God. But if you're a man and you say this, you know, well, I'm not the spiritual one in the family. My wife is. Shame on you. You need to shake off those heavy bands and stop listening to the lies of the devil. Get up and develop a backbone and lead your family in paths of righteousness for His namesake. Then you'll be in line with God's Word and God can bless the family in Jesus' name. Just plain and simple. I've learned many of these things over the years. And I've, learned, I've made a lot of mistakes. And How many know you can, you can, you can draw riches out of the black areas of your life. You can draw a lot of knowledge out of the black areas of your life. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And some of those that I've, uh, the mistakes that I've made, hear me, child of God, is not to do that again. I've learned one thing as being married with four daughters. Don't talk about weight. <laughs> Hello. Because if you talk about weight, you're going to be on the hit list. But I said this to my family. I said, if you want the truth, you're going to get the truth from me. If you say, how do I look in this outfit? I'm going to tell you the truth, how you look in that outfit. Come on, family. 
You know I'm, I'm telling the truth. I'd say, you're fat. Oh, man, well, what's wrong with you? Well, you ask me, I can't say, you're beautiful. How many know that would be a lie? Am I right? Would it be truth, or would it be a lie? Some would say, well, you can put it in a, in, in a different manner than, uh, than that. Well, okay, you're a beast. Well, what do I get? What do I do? How do I say it? Well, I think maybe you ought not to eat another hot fudge sundae. That sounds better. (laughs) If you want to keep peace in the family, keep your mouth away from the weight programs, especially when it comes to women. Now they can look at you and say, man, you really got a pus gut on you. But you say, you got one too. And you're out the door. And no more. Hello. They just can't take that. I've learned a lot of things over the year. My mouth got me in trouble. Some things you just stay quiet on. Even though you would like to say something. But if they ask my opinion, they're going to get it. Because I'm not going to lie. Hear me. Or I'll say this, I just don't want to comment. <laughs> you know, because I know if I, if I say something, it's going to, going to get me in trouble. But folk, hear me. Hallelujah. There's imperfections in every one of us as being fathers. I have not seen a perfect dad yet except for one, and that's my heavenly father. And can I tell you, and I'm going to cut this down. Can I tell you, we're full of imperfections, but I want to be like my heavenly Father, that He would perfect the very things that concerns me and concerns my family and concerns the church family. God, help me to be the man of God that You want me to be to lead my family in paths of righteousness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just don't want to pass this life through just being a nonchalant type of dad. I want to leave a legacy to my children that dad knew God with all of his heart, with all of his life, with all of his soul. I want to leave them a godly inheritance. Hallelujah, if I should go by the way of the grave and that godly inheritance, hear me, child of God, it's not consistent of big bank accounts and big houses and what have you. Hear me, child of God, the best inheritance that you can give your children is an inheritance that the love of Jesus Christ has placed in your heart and in your life. Why it will benefit in this life and the life to come. There's going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet by and by. Ever come on back, I want to sing that song. If we would, please, musicians, bless the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Oh, praise God forever. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Um, I don't think I've ever said this to anyone, but I was thinking about my father, and he died when I was nine years old. And I'm the youngest of nine kids. My father was an alcoholic. He was abusive both verbally and physically. The one thing he taught me before he left this world was that the day that he died, and he died at home, and we knew he was going to die, and my mom had kept us from school, and she sent us upstairs to, to clean up, and it was during that time I didn't know, but it was that time that he died. And after he had passed, she came upstairs and told us, but... I remember that morning that he died that he asked that one of the older siblings go to the pastor. I never knew my dad ever being in church. My mother took us to church, but not my dad. Uh, But before the pastor got to the home, he passed away. But he taught me something. I remember going in the living room and seeing him pray constantly that whole morning couldn't really hear him 
uh, but I knew that's what he was doing as, as a child. So I, w I just want to say that even though he was that type of father, the abusive and uh, a drunkard, you know, I remember him blacking my mother's eyes. And, and all the kids had gone at the time he had died. There was only three of us still at home. Something that really stuck out is that I felt in my heart that my dad gave his life to the Lord that day before he died. That he called out for someone to come and pray. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Glory to the Lord. That's why I say things that stick into your thought patterns that you cannot shake. Hallelujah. And the greatest inheritance, as I said, that you're going to have is that you see every one of your children in heaven every one of your grandchildren in heaven. What a blessing that's going to be. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Can you stand your feet as we sing this? Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. There's going to be a meeting in the air. Do you know it? I don't know if I do. Hallelujah. We'll sing it anyhow. There is